I'm in programming. So we'll continue with these case studies and examples uh, where we use dynamic programmings to come up with efficient algorithms. But before, before I proceed further, uh, let's just recap uh, what kind of tricks we learned yesterday. So anybody wants to have a go at what, if you want to solve a problem via dynamic programming, how do you go about it? Yes, yeah, so defining a subproblem is one of the most critical ingredients of dynamic programming. You want to set up just the right kind of subproblem so that not only do you uh, use your subproblems to solve bigger problems, but you also have enough information to find the optimal solution for the global problem. So that's one trick. Uh, anything else? Indeed, uh, the solution of your current subproblem may depend on looking at the solutions of your smaller subproblems. So generally, the tricks are that you think in terms of filling out a table. Uh, this table uh, corresponds to solving various subproblems. And you always go dynamically by first solving some base case or some smaller problems. And using the solutions of the smaller problems to solve your larger problems. So, just to make things more concrete, uh, we'll recap this example which I started yesterday. And this is concerning the problem of finding the longest common subsequence. So let me just define it again, because we may, not, may have forgotten about it from yesterday. So assume we want to compare how similar two different strings S and S star are. And this has various applications in genetics, uh, in gene sequencing and so on. So the definition of a subsequence is that we say that small s is a subsequence of a string large s or a sequence large s if small s can be obtained from large s by deleting some uh, letters or alphabets or symbols from large s while maintaining the order of the other uh, alphabets in, this, in the string. So this is the definition of a subsequence. Um, we will not focus on just one string and finding a subsequence. We will actually look at two different sequences, S and S star. And for both of these, we say that small s is a common subsequence if it's, if it's a subsequence of both. And we are interested in finding common subsequence which are of maximal possible length. So this is the problem that we are interested in solving, and we want to do it via dynamic programming. So this is the setup of the problem, where the instance is two sequences s and s star. Both these strings may be of different lengths. In this case, uh, s is of length n, and s star is of length m. So this is our input. We're given two strings, and we want to find a common subsequence, and in particular, a common subsequence of maximum possible length. So this is our task. And what we want to do is we want to find the, uh, instead of just finding the solution, we'll be focusing first on finding the length of the longest possible subsequence. And we'll see that this is enough, this will give us enough information to actually find the uh, actual solution as well. So uh, the way to proceed is by finding the right subproblem. And we want to set up some recursion where we set up a problem and we want to solve that problem. And solutions to these subproblems will give us the global solution. So the right way to set up this particular problem is that we define Cij as um, the length of the longest common subsequence of truncated sequences Si and Sj where Si is the same as uh, string S, but only restricted to the first I elements. And Sj star is same as S star, but we only restrict ourselves to the first J uh, symbols or letters. So the idea is that we first focus on the prefix, which is really small, and gradually we start to look at longer prefixes. Eventually, we will look at the overall string, which is the case when i is equal to n and j is equal to m. 
And for that particular length, if you find that solution, that will be the global, uh, the size of the global optimal solution. So this is the problem we want to solve, which is C i comma j, and C i comma j is the length of the longest common subsequence of the truncated sequences S i and S j star. So the way to do it is we say that c i j is equal to 0 if i is equal to 0 or j is equal to 0. And that makes sense, right? Because if one of the strings is empty or is null, then you cannot have a, a subsequence which is of length 1 or more. So the solution will be 0 if i is equal to 0 or j is equal to 0. In other words, if either of the two strings is null, then we cannot have a common subsequence which is of length which is greater than zero. Another case of this recursion is that C i j is equal to C i minus one comma j minus one plus one and that's the case if i comma j is greater than zero and a i is equal to b j. And that's the case when we look at the ith letter of string s and the jth letter of string s star and we see that the, both the letters coincide. In that case, we know that we have one additional element which we can add to our solution. And the remaining solution is simply the optimum of restricting ourselves to i minus 1 symbols from the s string and j minus 1 letters from s star string. Finally, uh, it could be the case uh, that a i and b j do not coincide. They're not equal. In that case, we already know that we have solved all the smaller subproblems, but we do not have to restrict ourselves to looking at all the smaller subproblems. All we need to do is we look at the minimally smaller problems, which is c i minus 1 comma j and c i comma j minus 1. So just decrease this problem slightly. We know that this problem has already been solved because it's smaller than our current problem c i comma j. And since we already have the solution for both this and this, we can just take the maximum of both these values, and by this, we derive um, the value c i comma j. Any questions regarding this uh, recursion? OK, so let's look at an example. So this is the same example which can be seen graphically. Uh, essentially, we are filling out a table. So you can think of S as this particular string. Is there any question here? Excuse me. Thank you. So this is S, uh, string S. This is string S star. And what we do is we start to fill out a table finding the lengths of the optimal common subsequences while we are restricting our attentions to certain prefixes of S and S star. So first thing to notice is that let's say one string is empty. So let's say we have uh, an empty string for S star. In that case, we know that the length of the common subsequence has to be 0. So we can easily fill out the first row and the first column with zeros. And this is simply because of this particular case we had, where if i is equal to 0 or j is equal to 0, then you can fill out those entries with simply the value 0. So this is exactly what we did here. When i is equal to 0, then you fill out this. And when j is equal to 0, you fill out this, and we get all zeros. After that, we've already filled, we uh, have some information, and we use that information to propagate or fill out the rest of the entries of the tables. And we do it in a very methodical manner. So we already know that this column and this row is filled. What is the next? largest subproblem which we can look at. It's this particular entry. And note here, in this particular entry, um, i is 1, j is 1 as well. And for this, a i, as, uh, the first entry here and this first entry here, they do not coincide. So this means that we are in this particular case. And we take the maximum of these two values. These two values are both 0. So we just take, derive this value 0 from, let's say, this one. So we get a 0 here. By using this formulation, we can propagate and fill out the whole table. And once you fill out the whole table, 
we know that this particular value is the length of the longest common subsequence while taking into account the whole string here and the whole string here. And if you look at this example, you also have these arrows which tell you how did you derive or find this particular value. So for example, when you are here, this particular value is 1 and this value is 1 because this b and this b coincide and you get an additional value of 1 which is 1 more than the, the value which is already here in one row before and one column before. So this value is derived by seeing this value which is 0 and adding one value here because we know that b and b coincide for this particular entry. So note here that every time you increment, for example here you see that all these are 1's and here you have 2. The reason is because you see that this value corresponds to this entry C. This column corresponds to C as well. So you have the case that uh, the second case has happened where A i is equal to B j. Both entries coincide. So you can increment by looking at a diagonally uh, going left and up, looking at this value and adding one more to that value. So this is the way how you fill up the whole table and this is a very nice way to actually uh, intuitively think about dynamic programming as well. It's essentially filling out a table by looking at values which are uh, top or left and gradually filling out a table. Once you fill out the table, you have enough information so that not only can you find the length of the sol uh, optimal solution, but you can also find the actual optimal solution. So in this case, you came up with the length of the optimal solution, which is 4. And this you can verify by just looking at the longest common subsequence, which is B, C, B, and A. And this particular co longest common subsequence, B, C, B, A, can actually be found by looking at the table as well. So you look at this value 4. This value 4 is derived by this particular entry. So you have an arrow here, and each arrow is actually telling you how to trace the string and you know which values are actually used in the longest common subsequence. It's always that value where A, I, and B, J coincide. So by filling out this table and looking at the arrows, you're actually able to find both the size of the optimal solution and as well as the optimal solution. Any questions regarding this uh, way of approaching longest common subsequence? Yeah? Um, so, so this is a way to look at this particular uh, problem uh, from a completely algorithmic perspective. So you have a pseudocode here. You just the way to think about it is that you have a two, two iterations going over all i's and all j's. And then when each i, you look at first smaller i's and j's, and then you gradually grow the table. So if you look at this pseudocode, this would be the best way to understand how to populate this table in a method. Yes. You can use different kind of data structures. Main idea is that once you've populated the information, you have enough information. So you can use any kind of data structure to your liking. I'm just giving you a very abstract idea of how dynamic programming works. So there are several ways to actually make an implementation of this. Um, you could use arrays. That would be enough as well, because in each array, uh, you can also track, so instead of arrow, you can also track not just the value which is for A, I, and B, J, not just the value, but you can also find, uh, you can derive what particular entry. You can basically think of it as uh, having two different pieces of information here. So you can think of it as a double array where you can just say that 7, 6, in this particular entry, 7, 6 is derived from 6, 6. OK, so you can just think in terms of uh, arrays or matrices as well and simply put an additional piece of information here which points to the previous one. So you can simply thinking of arrays is sufficient to uh, populate the table as well as get the actual string. Is that fine? So once you have this information, for example, 7, 7 is point, 7, 6 is pointing to 6, 6, then you can simply say that if 7, 7 uh, is equal to this value, then you can simply point and trace your way and find the string as well.
So there are se many different ways you can go about it, but the main idea is that dynamic programming helps you in solving smaller problems to solve larger problems. And main thing is that you want to keep track of all the information. So in case some entry is being used to find another entry, you can find many different ways to store how you have this dependence. And this theme is actually used in many of the examples. You'll notice that in many, some of the examples, we were not actually tracking the, the optimal solution. You could even try to keep track of the optimal solution as well. Uh, in each, by e each entry, you can say that by this point, what is the optimal solution, right? But uh, often you do not need to keep track of optimal solutions. You can simply have this dependence and keep track of this dependence by different methods. So this is an idea which is used universally in many examples and many problems where dynamic programming can be used. Okay. So we looked at a problem where you had two different strings and you wanted to find the longest common subsequence of those two strings. Now the question is that instead of having two strings, what if you had three strings? Is it the case that uh, the dynamic program that you already had in the previous slide can you use that to find the longest common subsequence of three different strings? Or do you have to reformulate your algorithm to uh, solve this problem? Any ideas? Yes? Uh, you just find the longest between two of them, and then you take that string and find the longest between the third. Yeah, so that is a very natural idea which uh, one would think of when trying to extend an uh, algorithm which is already there for two strings and use it to solve a problem which is actually concerning three different strings. So this is indeed the question that can we just find the longest common sequence of three strings by first finding the LCS of two strings and using that to find the LCS of, uh, LCS of S1, S2, and then S3. But the issue is that in this very natural and uh, naive approach, maybe, but it sounded quite natural, actually does not work. So we can't just use our previous algorithm and apply it directly uh, twice to find the longest common subsequence of three different strings. And here's a simple example where uh, this problem might happen. Here you have the case that S1 is this string, S2 is this string, and S3 is this string. You can find the longest common subsequence of each of those pairs of strings. You have three different pairs, S1, S2, S2, S3. There should be parentheses here. And S1, S3. You can find all the longest common subsequences here. And we do this, what you realize is that the longest common subsequence of doing uh, this method in pairs gives us these, but the actual longest common subsequence of these three strings is actually something which is uh, longer than any of these three strings. So you can't just use the previous algorithm directly uh, and come up uh, with the longest common subsequence for three strings. However, uh, the idea which we had in a previous slide can easily be generalized to not only deal with three strings. I'll just give you uh, a formulation for three strings, and it'll be fairly evident how to generalize it further uh, to take care of any number of strings. So let's just deal with three strings and you can see how you can generalize this idea for any number of strings. So in this case now we have three strings instead of two. Um, we want to find the longest common subsequence of S, S star and S double star. We again, we focus on the length of the longest common subsequence, and we again focus on the prefixes of the strings. In this case, uh, we say that if we are solving the problem D, I, J, L, that means that we are restricting the first string to the first I symbols, the second string to the first J symbols, and the third string to the first L symbols. And the recursion is also very similar to the previous recursion. Uh, again, we have the case that if any of these values, i, j, or l is 0, then you have the case that at least one string is an empty string. In that case, you know that the longest common subsequence length is going to be 0. If the entries a, i, b, j, and c, l coincide, in that case, you know that you get one additional uh, increment in your longest common subsequence. 
and you simply need to solve a slightly sm smaller subproblem where <coughs> instead of i, you have i minus 1, j, you have j minus 1, and l, you have l minus 1. And finally, if a, i, b, j, and c, l do not coincide, in that case, previously we were just looking at these two cases, and now we look at all three different cases where the subproblem is slightly smaller uh, than the problem we are solving. So instead of i, j, l, one of these entries is one less. This is the case, and we take the maximum of these three entries. Uh, this is going to give us the optimal value for d, i, j, l. So this is how we deal with uh, longest common subsequence when in, uh, dealing with three strings. And the same idea you can easily generalize to any number of strings. So we have an algorithm now for sol solving longest common subsequence of two strings as well as for multiple strings. Now we look at a slightly different problem. We are not looking at longest common subsequences, but we are looking at the shortest common supersequence. So the shortest common supersequence is one which <coughs> contains both of S and S star is one where both S and S star are subsequences of S and it's the shortest possible. So how do we go about it? Well, you can simply solve the related problem which you already solved in the previous slides, which was finding a short, longest common subsequence, and that is enough to find the shortest possible supersequence. And why is that? So what you do is you find the longest common subsequence of S and S star. So for example, if S is this and S star is this, you can find the longest common subsequence, which is B, C, A, D. So you find the longest common subsequence. And in order to find the shortest common supersequence, you simply add the corresponding letters or symbols which were not present in this uh, entry accordingly in this. And you find the longest, uh, shortest common supersequence. So just by knowing how to solve longest common subsequence, you can also find shortest common supersequence. So this is again an example where you do not have to design a special algorithm for each uh, problem separately. You can simply reduce one problem to another, and this is a very valuable technique in computer science. Any questions regarding this slide? So B, C, A, and D are given. Now the only requirement is that A has to be before B, and X has to be before B. We do not have any uh, restriction on whether A comes before X or not. So you know where A and X should be. They should certainly be before B. So you place them here. Similarly, between B and C, you have A here. So you put A here. Between B and C, you have Y here, you put Y here, and you continue. So you just put them arbitrarily as long as the order is, uh, is satisfied with respect to the original two strings. All right? OK, so now we come to one of the, actually, one of the earliest applications of dynamic programming. This is an approach which has been around for more than half a decade. It's a, one of the first dynamic programs which was proposed by Bellman. It's called the Bellman-Ford algorithm. Uh, did you guys cover Dijkstra's algorithm in one of the previous? Yeah. yeah? So Dijkstra's algorithm is a very nice, efficient algorithm which finds the shortest path uh, when you do not have negative weights in uh, the graph. Bellman-Ford has some advantages. One particular advantage is that even if the graph has some negative weights, it can still be applied to find the shortest path. The only condition we have is that you can have some negative weights, but you cannot have a graph where there is a cycle which is of total weight which is negative. Because if that's the case, you can simply go over those cycles again and again and uh, have even shorter paths. So minus infinity would be the, so you do not want such cases. So you assume that the input is a graph which may have some negative weights, but these weights there is no cycle which has an aggregate uh, weight which is negative. So the goal, in, again, is just like in the Dijkstra's algorithm is that you want to find the shortest path from S to C. S is the source, T is the target. 
And we know that since there are no negative cycles, we can simply look at uh, paths. We do not have to worry about cycles. So each shortest path can have at most v, total number of vertices minus 1, edges. And we will focus on certain kinds of subproblems, just as is the case in dynamic programming. And in this particular case, for each vertex v and every i, which is an integer from 1 to n minus 1, we will let the subproblem be finding opt i comma v, which is the subproblem of finding the length of the shortest path from v to t, which contains at most i edges. And we know that if i is n minus 1, we have already solved the problem for the shortest path from v to t uh, because any shortest path is going to be at most v minus 1 edges. So our goal is to find opt of n minus 1 comma s because we need at most n minus 1 edges and we want to go from s to t. So this is our goal. And in order to find that, we actually not just find the optimal length from s to t, we actually find the optimum length of the shortest path from each other vertex to t. So just a couple of observations. So one observation is that if we already have the shortest path from a vertex v to t, which is of this type, this is the shortest path, then we also know that this particular path where we remove v is the shortest path from p1 to t. Because if that was not the case, then this particular path would also not be the shortest path from v to t. So this is again an example of what I call the cut and paste proof yesterday for many of the arguments I was giving. It's a similar kind of argument. Uh, one other observation we have here is that if we have the shortest path from v to t, which has m edges, where m is some value between 1 to v minus 1, then opt k comma v is equal to opt m comma v for all k greater than m. And that is because if we have already uh, restricted ourselves to i here, we increase the number of edges, then we can only do better, we cannot do worse. So this is an idea which is an idea of having a relaxing the conditions under which you're finding an optimal solution. So gradually we are increasing this k, and as we increase k, we are actually giving ourselves more options for finding shortest paths. So the shortest, the, the smaller this value is, we are restricting ourselves to what kind of solutions we can find. This, the moment this k is uh, v minus 1, that means that we are not restricting our solutions at all, because any solution is going to have at most v minus 1 edges. So this is the general idea, and now we come up with a solution. The solution is, of course, based on finding the right subproblem, which we already defined, and then having a recursion. And the right recursion here is that opt i comma v is the minimum of two different values, minimum of opt i minus 1 comma v. First note here that opt i comma v can is at most, it is at least, uh, sorry, is at most opt i minus 1 comma v because if you increase i minus 1 to i, you can only get a better solution. Secondly, we, since we are using dynamic programming, if you solve smaller problems, we can use that information to find a larger problem. And in this case, in order to find i comma v, we not only look at this, but we also look at i minus 1 comma p, whereas p is any given vertex in v, plus w e, which is the length of going from v to p. So this is the edge length from going from vertex v to p. And of course, any path which is from v to t has can, could also possibly go from v to p and then from p to t. So by using this kind of uh, formalism, we have exhaustively considered all possible options. And we have this recursive formulation which helps us from using these optimal solutions for these smaller problems, i minus 1 comma p, i minus 1 comma v, we can use it to find an optimal solution for any given v and i. So for any given v and i, we can restrict ourselves to looking at uh, problems where i is, it's, is actually i minus 1. So we're looking at smaller problems. 
So this is the formulation and uh, since we just simply go over all possible edges here, uh, the running time is simply going over all Vs, which is this I, and it corresponds, and this size of the number of edges is simply corresponding to the case that we only restrict ourselves to looking at all possible edges that uh, are attached to vertex V. So in, in general, if you look at all possible uh, vertices like these, we are essentially looking at all possible edges. So in each iteration, we, there are V minus one iterations, in each iteration, we just look at at most all the edges. So that's why the running time is uh, the number of vertices times the number of edges. So note here that after we've done, we have essentially find opt v minus one, uh, the, the number of vertices minus one, comma v. So by using this information, this algorithm has produced the length of the shortest paths from every vertex u to t. And instead of just uh, restricting our attention to uh, the length of the shortest paths, you can also keep track of the actual shortest paths as well in the table. So you can use all the information that you have, store it, use it to find solutions for larger problems, and in this way, you can find the shortest path from every vertex to t. So we started off with uh, trying to find the shortest path from s to t, but we ended up uh, finding the shortest path from every vertex to t. By a very similar approach, you could also change it around and focus on uh, not the target, but the source. So you could also find uh, the, all the shortest paths from s to every other vertex, and this would be very similar in nature as well. Um, we've looked at two different algorithms in this course now. Dijkstra's algorithm, which does not require, uh, which requires you to have non-negative weights. We also have Bellman Ford's algorithm, which was one of the first dynamic programming formulations, uh, which concerns, uh, which allows you to have some negative weights and is used as a dynamic programming formulation. And now we come to uh, another shortest path algorithm, which is called the floyd warshall algorithm. So again, we have the similar kind of input. We have an input where you have a graph, G, uh, with directed weighted graph where you have vert vertex set V and you have weights for each edge. And again, we allow for edges to have negative weights. And again, you impose the condition that you do not have uh, negative cycles. Again, we use a similar kind of uh, approach, but slightly different. So this time around, we will find the shortest path from each vertex VP to vertex VQ. And the subproblem that we set up is called opt of k comma vp comma vq. And this is the length of the shortest path from vertex vp to a vertex vq, which only involves other in intermediate vertices which are from this particular set. So this k corresponds to this restriction that you only look at vertices from v1 to vk. And the idea is again going to be similar that Gradually, we are going to relax this restriction of only focusing on the first k vertices. As you increment k uh, and make k to be uh, the number of total number of vertices minus one, you've essentially uh, made the problem relaxed enough to allow for any possible solution, and which will also include the optimal solution. So, what is the um, recursive formulation here? So, opt k vp comma vq is the minimum of opt of k minus one vp vq. So we find the length uh, only restricting ourselves to the first k minus one vertices. But now since we also want to include possibly the kth vertex, how do we do that? We simply say that opt of k minus one to vp to vq plus opt of k minus one vk to vq by doing this, we already have stored this information because we already solved these sub-problems. So we have enough information to exhaustively go over all possible cases. And so using the information of the smaller problems, you can find uh, the solution for this problem, and you're done. So again, the idea, as from the previous slide from Bellman Ford, is that you're gradually relaxing the constraint 
that you only can look at the first k vertices. As you increment k, you're allowing for more optimal solutions. And once k is v minus 1, uh, you're guaranteed to include the optimal solution and the length of the optimal solution as well. One nice thing about this algorithm is that, uh, firstly, just a uh, point about the running time. It's, uh, it's cubic in, in the size of the vertex set. And the second is that even though we required that in order to find an optimal solution, it shouldn't have a negative cycle, if there is a negative cycle, then of course uh, the length of the shortest path may be minus infinity. But what is nice about this algorithm is that we can detect a presence of a negative weight loop by simply looking at this particular value, which is opt of n up up. And why is that? Because you go from, this is this basically denotes the length of the shortest path where you start from up, you end in up, so it's a cycle. This cycle has at most n different edges. It cannot have more, n is enough. And if this value is negative, you know that there is a negative cycle in the graph. So not only can Bellman, uh, Floyd Warshall uh, find all the shortest paths, but it can also help you detect a negative cycle in the graph. Any questions? OK, so let's proceed to uh, one other case study, which is edit distance. So edit distance is also a very famous problem in uh, string algorithms, where you have two different strings, string A and string B. And the idea is that you need to edit one string to convert it into another string. Another way to think about it is, what is the number of operations required or the, what is the cost of the num uh, operations required to change one string to another. You could have different costs for different kind of operations. In particular, you could have a cost for deleting a character, a cost for replacing a character, and a cost for inserting a character. So we'll say that insertion cost is CI, a deletion cost is CD, and a replacement cost is CR. And the task is, again, to find the lowest total cost transformation from A to B. So you want to change string to string B by using uh, least number of operations. And if all operations have unit cost, it's also called edit distance. So this has various applications. I won't go too much into what are the applications. Let's just jump into how to actually solve the problem. So as is always the case, you want to set up a sub-problem. And in this case, the subproblem is going to be called C i comma j, which is the minimum cost of transforming the sequence A while only restricting string A to the first i elements into string sequence B, which is only restricted to the first j elements, where i is some uh, value less than equal to n and j is some value less than equal to m. So again, we're trying to solve smaller problems and using those to find larger problems. So this is the recursive formulation here. So uh, I've just given you the formulation immediately, but it's going to be very evident soon why uh, this formulation works. So let's say we want to find the least number of the least cost operations to change string A to string B, where string A has I elements and J, uh, B has J elements. In that case, there are various things you can do, and these are the exhaustive cases. One thing is that you could simply delete the, the last element, the ith element of string A, which means that after you delete it, you have only the first i minus 1 elements, and then simply solve this particular problem, which is the problem of changing string A to string B while having string A's first i minus 1 elements and string B's J elements. So this is one case. Another case is this one, where you have I elements of string A and J minus 1 elements of string uh, B. So you change string A to string B, but uh, you need to insert another element, which is the ith element of string uh, B. The last two cases are where AI and BJ coincide. If that's the case, then you can simply solve the problem, which is smaller, where both elements uh, are I minus 1 and J, J minus 1. 
And finally, if they do not coincide, then you need to have a replacement. So this corresponds to this replacement cost, which coincides to AI uh, being changed to uh, BJ. So it's a replacement cost. So all these cases correspond to um, cases uh, in this recursive formulation. And it's fairly evident to see why this holds. And once you have set it up in just the right way, then actually finding the total cost as well as finding the order of operations is easy. Any questions regarding this uh, recursive formulation? All right. So, so this is basically uh, almost the end of uh, our lecture on dynamic programming. We went over various uh, case studies and examples uh, where we used this formulation of finding a subproblem, defining a subproblem, and then uh, using solutions of subproblems to solve larger subproblems. So before I end this lecture, I wanted to give you one particular puzzle. It's one of the most uh, interesting examples in this lecture. And this will be left as an exercise. So this is an example of using dynamic programming where you have this particular problem. And the problem is that you have n turtles. So this is, if you look at this problem, it has ingredients of many different things which we have already covered in our lecture. It has some ingredients of, um, it has in some ingredients of the knapsack problem because you won't, don't want to exceed a certain capacity. And it also has some other aspects to it. So it's a nice, exercise for you to think about in order to understand uh, whether you have grasped the concepts in this particular lecture. So the problem is that you're given n turtles. And for each turtle, that turtle has both a weight and a strength. The strength of a turtle is the maximal weight that you can put on it without cracking its shell. And the task is pretty interesting. The task is to find the largest possible number of turtles that you can stack one on top of the other without cracking any of the turtles. So you want to uh, put more turtles on one particular turtle, but you do not want to put too many because you have this constraint uh, that uh, the turtle's back should not be broken. So a turtle's strength is the maximum you can put. Uh, the weights of the turtles has to be less than equal to strength of each turtle. And this has to be imposed for each particular turtle. So the idea is that you want to come up with a way to do this. Uh, you do not want to have, uh, you do not want to solve exponentially many subproblems. So you want to find first an ordering in which to find, uh, stack up the turtles, or consider stacking up the turtles. So in many of our examples, we looked at there was a natural ordering. For example, in, in a string algorithm, we simply went from left to right where we first focus on the prefixes, and we kept on increasing the prefixes. So the trick to solving this particular turtle tower problem would be that you um, find a natural ordering where this can be solved. So I'm going to give you a hint for you to work on. And the hint is that it's helpful to think about turtles in a certain order. And that particular order is that you first look at turtles which have, you look at the sums of the strengths uh, as well as their weights. And this is going to be helpful for certain reasons. So I stop my lecture at this point. So this is going to take a bit longer. So uh, I'll request Alex to go over some of these examples in detail if required. I'm not sure if you have tutorials in this course. OK, so if needed, uh, uh, I'll ask Alex uh, to give a better overview of this particular problem, because it's going to take much longer than five minutes. But uh, it'll be a good test uh, for your understanding if you try to have a go at it and see how far you go. Uh, if you get stuck, uh, try to see uh, what are the issues which are preventing you from solving this problem. But try to keep in mind that, again, you want to solve problems in some dynamic manner. And this particular hint is quite helpful that you want to order turtles in an increasing order in some of their weights as well as their strengths. All right, so I thank you for your attention. And uh, some of you might be enrolled for the next one hour slot. 
so I'll, I'll be moving over to that particular lecture theater for that. Thank you.